Okay, well, I think that uh, what we're going to do is start on the Gospel Book of Acts, which is sometimes referred to as the fifth gospel. The gospel of Acts is right after the four. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts is next. And I think we'll work on that, but I thought I'd, this evening we'd do more of an introduction than anything. And the first thing I wanted us to notice is, is that the Acts of the Apostles is written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. So uh, that's pretty well authenticated, and uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. But before we get started, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the word of God. And we pray that you would please help us this evening to speak, help our hearers to get some spiritual good from this short time together. Bless us with your presence and make the word come alive in our hearts. And for what you do, we'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so to begin with, I'd like you to turn to the first chapter of Luke. And uh, let's see what Luke has to say. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, Luke says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth an order, a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, and which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know for certainty those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So this man is uh, receiving a, like a letter from Luke. He's being instructed in the gospel. And he is, uh, uh, Luke says that uh, the things that I'm writing are from eyewitnesses, from those who actually, uh, actually uh, saw Jesus as he, you know, had his ministry and did his miracles and those things. And so uh, Luke did not, it doesn't look like Luke knew Jesus personally when he was on the earth. That he became a believer after uh, Jesus ascended into heaven. However, he did interview Peter and uh, Mary and Mary Magdalene and a lot of other people and got their firsthand testimony. And he gave us kind of a historical narration. And that's what the Gospel of Luke is about. So now turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. After John is Acts. And... we find that Luke is writing to the same man. Acts chapter 1, the former treaties I made. So that's referring to the Gospel of Luke. O Theophilus, same guy, of all that Jesus began to both do and began both to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. So gospel, the Gospel of Luke ends with uh, the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven. And uh, at the end of Luke, um, 
remember that was the place where um, the, the two guys, the guy and his, maybe his wife, were walking to, to Emmaus from Jerusalem, and Jesus came alongside and walked with them to Emmaus. And he didn't, they didn't know who he was. He hid himself from them. And by the time they realized who he was, they, he vanished. And then in the last chapter of Luke, he is, uh, uh, Luke is telling us about how he came to the disciples. They're in a locked room. They're afraid. Uh, the authorities have just murdered Jesus. Uh, and they're next. The, obviously, the Jews and the Romans government want to stamp out this, uh, this crazy Christian sect that has been going on. These revolutionaries need to be eliminated. And so the disciples are scared to death and they're hiding in a room that's locked and suddenly Jesus appears in the midst of them. Just boink. And it's so phenomenal that they think he's a ghost. They're scared to death because they think it's a real ghost that he couldn't possibly be alive. And he says, come here and touch me. Handle me. See that I'm real. I have bones and flesh. I'm not a ghost. And uh, they had a, um, like a, uh, they believed, uh, the Jews are very superstitious people. If you read anything about them, you find out they were. But uh, they believed that it was not possible for a ghost to eat or drink. And so Jesus said, have you got any food here? And they had some honey, uh, honeycomb and some fish. And they gave it to Jesus and he ate before them, proving that he was real. And so... Jesus gave them their instructions in the last chapter of Luke about waiting in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit should be poured out upon them. So now we're over in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. The former treaties I have made, O Theophilus, of all the things, all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles in whom he had chosen. So this is the original 11. Remember Judas says uh, committed suicide, and so he's out of the picture. But the original 11 that Jesus chose to be his disciples, to whom also he, that is Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs. So Jesus is, is showing himself not to just the disciples, but um, later on we find out that over 400 people personally witnessed that Jesus was alive. And this is all taking place and being written down at the time that this happened. So... If there was anybody that was going to refute it, they certainly would have stepped forward. So he showed himself alive after his passion. The, the passion that they're referring to is his death on the cross. Whenever you see his passion, that's what they're talking about. Uh, maybe in some of your uh, church background, you might remember Passion Week, the week before uh, Easter. So after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days from the time he was resurrected, he came out of the tomb, he is showing himself to people. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So remember, even uh, early in the Gospels, they came to John and said, who gave you the authority to baptize people? And John the Baptist said, hey, I only baptize with water. 
There's one coming after me that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of the Gospels, I think in John and Luke and maybe even Mark, Jesus talks about that after he has suffered and died and resurrected, he will send the Holy Spirit upon men. And so that's what the Acts of the Apostles is about. Uh, somebody titled it the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. Somebody else titled it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because we see the tremendous change that came over the disciples and their followers when the Holy Spirit came on them. And so uh, he instructs them to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And that's a good admonition for all of us. After we become born-again Christians, we should wait for the Holy Spirit to fill us. And then uh, we will be prepared and ready to fulfill His will in our lives. So, they, when they were together, they, when they came together, verse 6, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will at this time, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So there's still people that are thinking that, you know, now that Jesus is resurrected, perhaps he's going to uh, reestablish the political kingdom of, of the Jews and kick the Roman government out, and uh, they're going uh, to have their country back again. But Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times, the seasons, which the Father hath in his own power. So the Lord said, no, it's not time yet. This will happen, and it's yet to happen. Uh, Israel became a nation once again overnight in 1948. It was a nation that was born and came into existence and has been a uh, legitimate um, independent nation for, from that time to now. And... Uh, but the, the Jews want even more than that. They want God himself to be their ruler. And that will soon transpire when Jesus returns to earth the second time. Then he will reign and rule not only over Jerusalem and Israel, but over the entire earth. So he said to him, no, it's not time yet. God has this in his power. In verse 8, he said, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And then he tells us what will happen when they receive the Holy Ghost. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, even unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So as he was speaking to them, he just started going up. And they're all standing there looking as he went up. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go to heaven. So when the Lord returns, he's going to come just like he left. He won't be in a rocket ship. He won't uh, be in a chariot. He's just going to descend out of the sky the same way he went up. Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from Mount called Olivet. Apparently, this is where they were when Jesus ascended, Mount Olivet, which is uh, about uh, less than a half a mile from Jerusalem, physically. And that is the place where Jesus will probably descend, the same place where he went up. So, which is a Sabbath day's journey, and that was the distance you could travel on the, on the Sabbath day without breaking the Sabbath. They said there's a limited amount of space you can go. Um, 
the, the, the rabbis had figured out all kinds of ways to work around this. Uh, Adam Clark said that uh, what you could do is if, if the gate of the city was 2,000, uh, 2000 um, steps approximately from your home, then you could count the gate of the city as your house. So then that gave you another 2,000 to walk outside the city. And, and they had ways of, of making uh, temporary uh, places of abode so that they could stretch this all out. But they were supposed to only go about 2,000 steps on the, on the Sabbath day. So they were a Sabbath day's journey, or a couple of thousand steps, from Jerusalem. And so they returned to Jerusalem, and when they were come in, they went into an upper room. Now, remember, when they had their last communion with Christ, they were in an upper room. Uh, Jesus had told Peter and John, I think, to go to the city and look for a fella carrying a water jug and follow him home. It was very unusual for a man to carry water. The women did all the water carrying. And so when they found him, they followed him home, and the master of the home had prepared a room for Jesus, an upper room for him and his disciples to have their last supper in. And so it looks like they, they returned to an upper room, and probably it was that same one where they had the last supper with the Lord. And there abode Peter, James, and John. Now Peter would be the, the big shot, you know, and James and John were the two brothers, and Andrew, and Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Ephesus, and uh, Simon, called uh, Zeotis, and Judas, the brother of James. So apparently there were two Judases, but this brother of James, who was Judas, he uh, sure didn't want to be called Judas after what Judas did. And so he changed his name to Jude. And if you look in the back of your New Testament near Revelation, you'll find a little letter written by someone named Jude, and that's probably James's brother. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So they're all there praying with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So these would be the cousins and brothers and sisters of Jesus who didn't believe in him then, but they do now. And so they, uh, they have begun uh, a prayer meeting, and they're all praying together. Remember, this would be the 41st day since Jesus has left. They begin the next day, they begin this prayer meeting. And then um, it says in verse 15, in those days... Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of their names together were about 120. So there was 120 believers all gathered at this prayer meeting. That was probably all of the Christians at that point in time. And Peter said, men and brethren, the scripture must needs be excuse me, fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now, Peter is referring to a passage of Scripture in the Psalms that David wrote. And if you look at Psalm number 41.9, you will find that David is writing about Judas and what he's going to do. And David is writing this like 600 or 700 or 800 years before it happened, that's pretty awesome. And so, um, let's see if we can find that. Okay, um, looks like at verse 9, David is talking, but it sounds like Jesus, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now you may have noticed or seen that if you sit somewhere, ah, sit, and 
you put your leg across like this, if your heel is pointing at somebody, that's an insult. Now in America, that's not very commonly known, but like in Mongolia, you never, never sat with your legs up like that so that you, you would be very insulting to someone. And this is the reason why, because of this saying in the Bible that this uh, traitor lifted up his heel against Jesus. And so, uh, let's see if there was a... What did my reference say? I want to look that up a moment. Yeah, that was uh, 41.9. So that was the one I read. My own familiar friend has lifted up his heel against me. So Peter is quoting that to the disciples. He's saying, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part of our ministry. So he was one of the 12 disciples numbered with them. And he obtained a part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Well, what had happened was, after Judas realized that Jesus was not going to save himself from the Romans, he went back to the priest where he got the money. Remember, they, brought, they, they, he, they gave him money to betray Jesus, and he took the money and he said, I have betrayed an innocent man. And the, the, the priest said, well, what's that to us? Too bad for you. And he took the money and he cast it down on the floor in the temple. And he ran out and hanged himself. And so the priest, they had a little confrontation, a little counseling. And they said, you know, this money is the money that was used for blood. Uh, it, would, it paid for the blood of this man. So it's not really legal for us to put it back in the church treasury. I don't know where they got this, but that was their thinking. And so somebody suggested, well, you know what? Um, we've got a lot of uh, strangers dying in Jerusalem and no place to bury them, uh, especially if they're not Jewish. We don't want to bury them in the Jewish cemetery. So why don't we take the money and buy a field? and used that for burying strangers. And that's exactly what they did. And so here's what Peter is saying. This man, Judas, purchased this field <laughs> to bury people in with this money. I mean, he didn't do it directly, but indirectly he did. And if you go to uh, Israel today, you can actually go and view this grave site that is called the Field of Blood where Judas purchased this, this place. And then, from what, from what it looks like Peter is saying here, that he fell headlong and burst asunder in the midst and his bowels gushed out, it looks like, at least historians think, that perhaps that was the very field where Judas chose to hang himself. And that when he hung himself, the rope broke. And he fell to the ground and his bowels gushed out. And so there he died a horrible death in the field that he purchased. I don't know if that's so or not, but it's interesting that that was the way that Peter said it, you know. And it was known unto all the dwellers in Jerusalem. So everybody knew about this. Insomuch that that field is called in the proper tongue, uh, Esildima which is to say, the field of blood. So Peter is giving us a translation of this Hebrew or Greek word and uh, telling us that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, here we have another quote from Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Now that's found in Psalm 6925, if, you're, if you have a reference Bible. 
69, 25, Where am I right here? Psalm 69, 25, all right. Um, let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to grief of those whom thou hast wounded. So uh, Peter felt like this was a prophecy that this was what was going to happen to Judas, that, that someone else was going to become uh, an apostle in his place. So then he says, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied us with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us? So besides the twelve disciples, there were other people who followed Jesus right from the beginning and stuck with him. And so uh, he says, beginning at the baptism of John, on to the same day that Jesus was taken up from us, one must, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So of these, I don't know how many there were, several apparently, they appointed two, Joseph called Barnabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And then they had prayer and said, Thou, Lord, thou knowest the hearts of all men. Show whither of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place." And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So now they have made twelve again. So now we're at chapter two, and now it's nine more days have passed. For the day of Pentecost was fully come. Pentecost was a season every year when the children of Israel would have a special feast. And so it was kind of interesting that the Lord came, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. But here they were. It was the day of Pentecost. They were all in one accord in one place. Okay, that means that they were all in agreement. There wasn't any arguing between them. They'd settled all their differences. They'd apologized to everybody. Everybody had really gotten prayed really good with God. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So they heard the sound of the wind. Right in the building, apparently. And it, was, and it filled the, all the house where they were sitting. So this 120 people are there. They've been praying for 10 days. It's now the 50th day since Christ has sent, ascended into heaven. And then Luke says, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire that sat upon each of them. Now, I don't know if the tongue sat on their shoulders or on their head. I've seen uh, illustrations done both ways. Uh, but there was, there was fire upon them. And verse 4 said, They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues or languages as God gave them utterance, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. The reason they were there was because this was the Feast of Pentecost. The Jews had come to celebrate Pentecost, and so they were all in Jerusalem. Now, when this was uh, noised about, or a voice was made, noise was made, the multitude came together, apparently outside of this upper room building in the street, and they were confounded, or troubled in their minds, our margin says in our Bible, 
because every man heard them speak in his own language. So they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? I thought these guys were all Galilean fishermen. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So it really, I, I don't want to contradict the word, but it sort of sounds like they had the gift of hearing. <laughs> because each one heard them speak in their own language. I remember it was uh, Sister Bonnie Cleaver, I believe, a missionary. Uh, she spent many, many years in Haiti. And I believe it was her that told us the story about her traveling to a remote church to have services. And they did not speak the same dialect as she was familiar with. And so she brought an interpreter along. And she spoke in the Haitian dialect that she knew, and the interpreter interpreted into the dialect of this little chap, this little pre church where they were preaching. And she began to talk, she began to preach, and her interpreter didn't start interpreting. And after a few minutes, she stopped and said, why aren't you interpreting? He said, I don't need to. We can all understand you perfectly. Wow, pretty awesome. And so now Luke gives us a list of the people who heard or of the of the people who heard them speaking. There is a list of all the different people that were there. Now I'm not going to try to read all these hard names, but I did find out that if you read all the way down to verse 11, the Cretes and the Arabians, that's 15 different languages. You can count them. 15 different languages. We do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. Do any of you remember Mr. Joseph, Reverend Joe Smith? He's come here many times. He was here for our camp meeting. Okay, he, uh, when he did his doctorate for his Ph.D., he wrote a thesis on the tongues in the Bible. And he found through his extensive study that every single time the Bible mentions tongues, it's referring to a language. Enough there. So they heard the wonderful works of God in their own language. And they were all amazed. And we're in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? But there were others that mocked. I wonder if some of the people didn't understand what was being said. Perhaps because their spiritual eyes were still closed? I don't know. But it said they mocked them, saying, these men are full of wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, lifting up his voice, and he said to them, you men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So we're talking about you know, daybreak was at six or five, then we're talking about eight or nine in the morning, the third hour of the day. He said, come on now, folks don't drink at this hour of the day. The drinkers are still sleeping at this hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay, now Joel had a prophecy. You'll find him in Joel chapter 2, verse, starting at verse 28. Joel is a little teeny book in the back of your Old Testament. I might even have to hunt for it a minute. It's, uh, I think, right after Daniel. No, right after Hosea. So Joel is uh, one of the later prophets just before the end of the Old Testament. Now remember, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament are 400 silent years. God did not speak for 400 years. But this is kind of the closing uh, chapters of the Old Testament. And so in Joel... Chapter 2, verse 28, Joel says, 
And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon shall blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, to the remnant of whom the Lord shall call. So the first part of this prophecy has now come to pass. Peter said, this is the prophecy of God, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord shall come. And so he's quoting that, that passage from Joel saying, this is the beginning of that. When the Holy Spirit came was the beginning of what theologians call the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Now the first, all of the Old Testament was the dispensation of the Father. Then the Gospels were the dispensation of Jesus. And now we have last the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And the rest of Joel's prophecy has not yet come to pass, but it will soon. When the Lord returns, these things shall come to pass. And then he said in verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, Peter's still preaching here, hear ye these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. So God put his approval on Jesus because of all the miracles and wonders and signs that he was able to do. Which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel, so that the Jews determined they were going to murder Jesus. They didn't care if he was innocent. They didn't care if they had no crimes against him. They were going to dream something up. They wanted him dead. And notice, the foreknowledge of God. God planned that Jesus should die on the cross. The scriptures say that Jesus planned to die on the cross before the universe was ever created. God already had this all figured out. And ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. It doesn't sound like Peter's too afraid now. He's lost his fear, and he's become very, very bold. Whom God raised up, raised from the dead, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So then Peter is preaching to them. He says, For David speaketh concerning him, saying, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So David prophesied that Jesus would not his body would not deteriorate or corrupt, but he would be raised from the dead. David further said, Thou hast known, made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy and with, and with thy countenance. And that is found in Psalm number 16, verses, boy, that's small print, 8 through 11. So you can look that up. 
And so, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of, all, of what the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So Jesus, uh, God had prophesied uh, that David's line, his descendant, would be, the, would be the Messiah. And indeed, Jesus descended from the line of David. And so this one, God promised him, he said it would be the Christ to sit on his throne. I think we'll stop here. It's um, about 8.10, and most folks have about a 40-minute time span today, so I think this is a good place to quit. But um, we, we, we want to, as we go through the book of Acts, we can see the amazing change that took place in the apostles after they received the Holy Spirit. They were no longer fearful men who denied the Lord or lied and swore, but they had become bold in Christ. And this at the very, at the very, at their lives were at stake. So, all right. Well, thanks for uh, coming this evening. Trust you've gotten some good out of this. Let's stand together for prayer and we'll be dismissed. Ah. Uh. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful word and pray that you would please write it in our hearts that we don't sin against you. Give us grace and help to understand your word that we may be wise unto salvation. And for your gracious help, we'll thank thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.